welcome to Slapshot Podcast, episode number 17, episode 3 of Quarantine, if you're keeping track. Um, I'm your host, Chris Formez. Thank you for being here. Um, I know there's not much for some people to do, but we're trying to stay alive the best way that we can, right? And not go insane from the people who are either stuck at home or I know there are some people who are, you know, working and doing stuff and you know, shout out to them. I'm one of those people who, you know, I'm, I'm considered essential. So let's start with that. But, you know, it's, it's, it's an absolutely crazy time. This has gone on now for, it's going to go on for about a month and some people are starting to lose their minds. Some people are starting to lose their jobs and that sucks a lot. It does, especially not having sports. I mean, I have, I've been playing a lot of uh, Call of Duty Warzone because I mean, why not, right? Um, so if you're doing that, keep doing it. I know other people are doing, you know, other things to stay active and whatnot. You know, working out or learning something new or cooking, and that's pretty cool. But you know, for me, I'm one of the lucky ones where I get to, I, I get to leave my home. Um, you know, I don't know how I feel about it every day, but. Um, yeah, it's just, it's something that we got to deal with right now and we got to continue to social distance, right? Because that's the important part. I know, right, today's Good Friday, right? Easter's around the corner and, you know, a lot of us are going to want to go visit friends and family. And I know some people are getting sick and tired of staying home and they just want to go out. And I mean, if, if you're reading the comment sections on posts on Twitter, A, a you should probably stop. <laughs> but I mean, I know there's a lot of frustration with people about, you know, they want to go out and, you know, they're losing jobs and people are saying, well, why don't you just let us choose if we want to go to work or not? You know, and that's, I feel like that's, that's not how you control this pandemic, right? And again, we're not going to get into your political beliefs or religious beliefs or all that stuff because that's not, this isn't a place to do it. This is a sports podcast and we will talk about sports, by the way, we will. Um, I'm going to recap as well. I did a fantasy hockey mock draft. Uh, right, Andrew Duhart. Uh, I don't know if I'm saying his last name right. Sorry in advance, Andrew, but um, he's a staff writer over at the uh, Fantasy Alarm, so he invited me to do um, a mock draft uh, a couple of weeks ago. So I was I was honored to be part of it. I'm going to break down the team that I built a little bit about that draft. I know it's a very early mock draft, right, for 2020, 2021, assuming hockey is back, um, because it doesn't look like hockey is going to come back this year, and that really. It sucks a lot, but I mean, it is what it is. I think that the number one thing is to keep people important. I know there's a lot of surveys coming out that's, you know, people saying, well, we're not going to go back to what, you know, to venues itself until there's a vaccine. Because, I mean, imagine crushing, I don't know, 21,000 people, or not crushing, cramming 21,000 people at the Bell Center together. You know, somebody's going to get sick. And, you know, we're doing, especially in Quebec, shout out to the people, you know, living in the province, man. I mean, we've been social distancing pretty well. There's been some nice numbers. Uh, the premier has been coming out and, you know, giving us this, you know, giving people the support that they kind of need, keeping us up to date and whatnot. Can't say the same about, you know, our friends south of the border, right? I've never heard our premier talk about the ratings. But again, this is not about political beliefs. This is not about how you feel about Donald Trump or whatnot. This is more about, sports and whatnot and like i said the quicker we do social distancing the, the the quicker we you know all work together and just stay home and try to limit the spread and flatten the curve and this you know this isn't new stuff that i'm telling anybody here or at least it shouldn't be new but you know as long as we keep working hard together life at some point will go back to some normal form of what we have will life go back to what it was before who knows i have no idea um, but I, I'm at least excited to be able to, at some point, watch some kind of sports because I have not, I have not, like, I'm not building League of Legends, you know, DFS lineups. I'm not going that far. I have no idea how it works. So I'm not going to start learning something new. Um, like, I'm tired of watching reruns of things that have already happened. And, you know, that's kind of cool. But, like, I've had enough. I've, I, I've seen it, I've done it. Um, running out of things to watch on YouTube, obviously. I mean, Netflix is just Tiger King, and I've watched I watched two episodes of it, and I was like, man, this is dumb. I'm not doing this again, so not doing that. So just, again, I know the weekend's coming up, and people want to go out and do things, and, you know, the arguments of, you know, well, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's old people who are dying and whatnot, and 
you know, we can't just sit there and say, well, you know what, it's old people dying. Why don't you just, you know, isolate them? Like a lot of old people are either by themselves a lot, regardless of what's going on now, right? They're in self, they're in isolation sometimes for long periods of time. And you can't just say as a society, you know, well, you know, just don't go around old people. That's, that's not how it is. Like we have to protect everybody. And, you know, young people can get it as well. This, you know, I, I know the mortality rate for young people is kind of low, but I mean, it, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't do anything. And again, there are people who are talking about, you know, the flu kills a whole bunch of people. And that's, I understand that it does, right? The flu does kill people. Let's also understand that the flu kills people during the winter months, right? And there is a vaccine for it as well. And, you know, people, if they choose not to get vaccinated and whatnot, that's their choice. And we already know that the coronavirus is much more deadly than, you know, the flu is. And there is no vaccine. There is no way to treat this either. There's no way to, you know, be immune from this respiratory, you know, virus. And that's, I think, kind of the scary part that people are believing. And again, I know that it's tough for some people who, you know, they can't work, they can't provide for their families, government checks are not coming in and whatnot. And that's, you know, that's a reality that sucks. And again, I know people are trying to say, well, you know, open up the economy, let us go back to work. Like you just, you can't do that. You can't. And again, I know people have different beliefs. People are in different situations. I'm not one of those people who are affected by not being able to pay bills and whatnot because I get to work and I get paid every two weeks like a regular person does. But again, I mean, you can't just send all these people out during a pandemic and say, well, you know what, we got to keep people working and whatnot so that, you know, they can provide for their families. And there are going to be, you know, some hard times, especially for businesses who are, you know, they can't pay their employees or they may not come out the other end, right? They may not make it. Some businesses may fold and never come back because of this, depending on how long it is. But if we work together to flatten the curve and, you know, get the cases coming down, you know, we can return to a a normal life where maybe you social distance, but in a different way, or maybe you, you know, only people who get sick quarantine, or I don't know, like, again, I, I don't know how you get to, to the other end and try to contain this, but there are lots of things that we can do that are not just sending out a whole bunch of people and saying, okay, we'll go back to your regular lives, keep packing, you know, public areas and parks and whatnot. That's, that's not where we are now. That's not where I want it to be either. Like I'm one of the fortunate ones who, you know, yes, I was home for 14 days because, you know, I, I mean, I don't even know what I had. I was probably, I don't even know if it was a cold or whatnot, but, you know, I stayed home and whatnot, but I'm still not, I, I wouldn't say I'm afraid to go out, but I am aware of where I am and where other people are. And, you know, I'm not one of those people I don't like, especially now during this time, I don't want to go to the grocery store. Right. There's a lot of people there. And I know some people are like they're they care less than I do. You know, I still see people going into the grocery store with their whole families, two, three, four people. I'm like, you don't need to. You know, there are still people who are either not feeling well or coming back from vacation who are not self isolating. Right. And it's important to do it, especially, you know, again, especially in Quebec, man, there are a lot of snowbirds that go down south and, you know, come back and they got, you know, you got to do your part. It sucks. No one likes it. But, you know, if we, if we all come together and we do this, this is what it is right now, right? This is, this virus is kind of testing, I guess, humanity's way or people in general and how they can cooperate together, right? Because, it's important to make sure that if we all work together, this is how you get past it. And again, you know, I know Donald Trump cares a lot less about that. And I mean, I'm one of the these people who I know is the economy more important than human lives? Of course not, right? People saying, well, the economy is more important than human lives or you need the economy more than what? Like this is a story to me about which came first, right? The chicken or the egg? <laughs> I mean, does the economy, to me, in my mind, the economy survives if there are people, right? But if you die, if people die and there's not enough people, then like it doesn't make a difference. Humans don't need the economy to survive. The economy needs humans to survive. And right now, what's more important is making sure that humans are being taken care of, that we are not ill, that we are capable of you know, going back to work in a safe environment, right? 
I mean, it, it's tough for some people. You know, there are people who are essential workers. You think of nurses, you think of police officers, firefighters, all these people who are, you know, going to work. They're getting sick, some of them. Some of them are dying, right? In New York, there's a lot of people, you know, public people who are dying. And that's unfortunate, right? Nurses in the same thing. I mean, you think of people who are in the grocery stores, right? I, th- I think I tweet about it a couple, right? It's kind of ironic that all these, you know, the people who are now being called essential employees or essential workers, a lot of them are making under 15 bucks an hour, right? Some of them, you know, the government stimulus package that they would get is about as much as they were making anyways per month. And a lot of them are, you know, they're going to work, they're doing their thing, they're, you know, they're trying to make sure that at least buy food and keep our lives going, and maybe on the other side of this, when we come out, we'll be able to change, you know, the way that we see people, you know, nurses sometimes are not, I don't think they're given the respect that they deserve sometimes doctors as well, especially nurses, right? I have a fun, I have a soft spot for nurses. I think they do a lot of good work. And I think sometimes we kind of forget that, or we just forget the reality that they live in, but you know, it's important to remember them. I think a lot of, you know, frontline workers that we think of now, people who work in grocery stores, people who work in pharmacies, basically if you're an essential employee, you know, taxi drivers, delivery drivers, people are delivering your food. I know some people who, you know, work for Uber or DoorDash or Fedora or whatever. Like these people are, you know, they're putting their lives at risk. And maybe we don't think of them as very essential, but I mean, today in our life, you imagine if your grocery store was closed. If we didn't, you know, if those people didn't show up and go to work and do not. And I know, again, the argument, <laughs> reading through comments, people are a lot of saying, well, you know, if they don't want to go, then don't go. Don't go to work. <laughs> and that's, like, that's not how it works. People who are working in grocery stores, they just want to be protected. Or, you know, employees at Amazon, let's say. You know, these people just want to be protected. They have to go. They don't have a choice, right? Like, in my, right, where I work, right, in our memo, it's clearly stated that we must show up to work. If we don't have symptoms, if we don't, if we're not sick and whatnot, you know, staying home because you're afraid to get the virus is not, is not a good reason. So employees who work, I mean, employees who work at these grocery stores and whatnot, they can't just say, well, I'm not going. Because at that point, you know, they'll be let go and whatnot, and they may not be able to claim their stimulus check, or they may not be able to claim unemployment or whatnot. So it's kind of, it's kind of a tough spot for them, but I support them. And like I said, if we all work together and we push through and we keep social distancing as much as it sucks, it does. And look, I, I love to stay home, man. Like, right. Like I didn't have a hard time on the two weeks staying home. I got myself occupied, even though there's no sports or whatnot. Sometimes it was lonely, but I mean, I made it out the other side. And I know it's tougher for other people. Some people have kids and, and, you know, they're bored and they don't understand why this is going on and there's no daycares and, you know, people are still going to work but they can't find, you know, people to take care of their children and whatnot. I know this is, this is tough. So if you're in a situation where, you know, this whole, you know, this whole quarantine and self-isolation or stay at home is kind of a little bit tougher, you know, for me, the reason why I do it, the reason why I'm not going to go see friends and I'm not going to go out and I'm not going to try to put myself in, you know, situations that may compromise me is because I'm doing it for somebody else, really, right? I'm doing it for somebody who their immune system is, you know, not the same as mine. I'm doing it for somebody who might have asthma, right? Respiratory problems. I'm doing it for, you know, older people who, you know, they can't fight the virus. They can't, their body is not the same. That's, that's why I'm I'm not worried about me, right? Like if I get it, I know I can, you know, there's a good chance that I'll probably get past it and I'll be able to survive and whatnot. But I'm not, again, I'm not worried about me. I'm worried about somebody else. And I think that's the way that most people should be looking at it. Like people are saying, well, you, you know, there's a low mortality rate for younger people. Fine. There is, but you can still carry it. And I would not feel okay if I knew that I may have been carrying something came into contact with somebody else and that person didn't survive. Like indirectly, I killed them. And that's not something I'm willing to to live with when I know the spread by just staying home, going to work. I don't, you know, it's, it's our, our lives have changed a lot where I work. We don't meet people. We, you know, I sit in, I stay in my office a lot all day and I don't, you know, I don't really see a lot of my coworkers and whatnot, get in my car, come home and that's it. I mean, on the bright side, I've spent a lot less money eating out at, you know, bars and restaurants and stuff. So, I mean, there's there's that positive as well. And, again, if you can support, 
a local business or whatnot. I did as well. I know there's a um, there's a site. Let me just find it here. And what I want to do at least once a week um, is try to just buy like a gift card for some of these places. I know I did. Um, so it's it's called a Rally for Restaurants, and they've partnered with uh, Stella Artois. And they've they're gonna they gave so if you buy a gift card via their site they're gonna give you a ten dollar voucher as well so let's say you buy a twenty five dollar gift card well it becomes a thirty dollar gift card right and so I bought a fifty dollar one um, to Next Door Pub and Grill um, they're in Montreal they're they're just around where Westmount is if you live in the area maybe you know but uh, Next Door Pub and Grill is quite a nice spot I enjoy uh, I enjoy their breakfast I enjoy their tacos as well. I enjoy their nachos. There's a lot of great things there. Um, so I decided to support them as well. If you want to support, you can do it, right? So anywhere, if you live anywhere in Canada, you can go to this uh, website, right? Um, it's called rallyforrestaurants.com and you can find restaurants in your area that you can support by buying a gift card. Um, I'm going to do one different one every week. It, I mean, I have friends who work in uh, bars and restaurants and whatnot and they're laid off and some of them are going to get paid. Some of them won't. So I'm going to try to do my part and, you know, support these local businesses that need it because these are the places that, you know, especially for me, you know, if I want to go out and watch sports or do something, there's a lot of great places in Montreal that I will go to. And they're not necessarily these large establishments. They're these local, you know, pubs and bars that, you know, they're, you, you get to know some of the staff or, and they're nice people and, you know, you get to meet some of the regulars and whatnot. So, I'm going to take the the opportunity to support as many as I can. I hope you do as well. And I and I know it's not everybody who can, but if you can give something, then do so. You can give to your local donating, I don't know, money or food to a food bank. Whatever you can do to help somebody else. I mean, you should be doing it all year round, but especially now when there are other people who need it sometimes more than we do. So keep doing the social distancing stuff we're gonna make it through and um yeah, maybe we'll return to some some normal life like i said we i did this 2020 2021 early mock draft and i was so excited to just focus on sports for a little bit i did a couple of mlb drafts but i mean we knew in march that the season was not going to start on time so i mean it was tough but I still did some, and this mock draft was, like I said, was pretty cool. Um, it, it was basically a 12-team uh, head-to-head category league, so I'm going to break down my picks per round. Um, I'll also leave the link um, in the uh, bio so you can go and check it out. If you check it out on YouTube, it'll be there. If you check it out um, at thefancyfix.com as well, I'll leave the link at the bottom so you can go and see everybody who participated in and their players that they picked. I'm going to break down mine, like I said, round per round, because this was one of the... I got sniped a whole lot. <laughs> and sometimes you look at other people and how they want to build their teams. And don't forget, it's a way early mock draft. Like, I mean, there's a good chance that this, this the 2019-2020 season doesn't get you know terminated. Who knows when next season will start. But it was nice to do this. It was, it was nice to see where some people you know pick their players and whatnot. So we're going to start with, obviously, round one. We're going to work our way down to... Um, round 16. There were 16 rounds here. Standard category leagues. Um, you know, nothing too important here to worry. No crazy stats or whatnot. But in a head to head category leagues, right? I try to get players who fill quite a few categories because I feel like that's important. Um, as always, right? Uh, Andrew did a breakdown of his draft a little bit, some players that he took. So you can go check that out. Um, at the fantasy alarm.com, right? You can check there. You can see a little bit about his team and how he broke down his parts as well. Um, as you should, you should also follow, uh, Andrew on Twitter. If you have a chance, he's a good, uh, good peep. So round one for me, right? Obviously it's a tough situation. I was given the sixth pick in the draft here. So I didn't really mind, I guess. Well, I didn't really mind. I like kind of picking in the middle of a snake draft i feel like that's good i know some people i mean i i hate when i have the first pick or the last pick and i had a couple of baseball drafts where i've had the last pick and i'm like man like i know you get to take on the turn but then you know you gotta wait a long time between let's say your second and your third pick 
Um, so I was picking sixth here. I went so obviously the you know the Connor McDavid's and whatnot went early. I was lucky. I took Leon Dreisaitl with the sixth overall pick, and I feel like I got a ton of value with taking Dreisaitl. I thought he would go way earlier here. Um, you know, Vasilevsky was taken fifth here. Kind of interesting. John Carlson went seventh overall. Um, but to me, I felt like it was important to take Leon Dreisaitl. I, if you read my breakdown at the beginning of the season, this season, right, um, back in, I think I did it in September, I kind of knocked Leon a little bit. Like, I didn't think his last season was as good as it should have been. And all he's done is prove me wrong. He is, he is the elite player, I think, that a lot of people don't think that he is. And I do believe that he is, he may not be Connor McDavid good, because let's, I mean, let's face it, Connor McDavid is on a whole other different level. But Leon, like Leon Dreisaitl, as of right now, right? Again, let's assume the season is over, okay? Leon Dreisaitl is 110 points. So he has 13 more points than his teammate, Connor McDavid. And that to me is pretty pretty rad if i don't say so yeah i, I felt like taking dry taking dry sidle at this spot would be he was probably one of the better players i would have taken him top three i would have gone let's say mcdavid um mckinnon and dry sidle. not to knock kutroff or anybody else that came there i also probably would have not taken a goalie in that round or a defenseman um i i know i've gone back and forth with drafting defensemen early i know there's a value to doing that as well um, but I wasn't, I, I just wasn't going to bite here and I didn't want to let, you know, dry side pass. So I took him there in the second round here. There was, this was a much more interesting. I had some players on the board that I was maybe looking to target specifically when it got to me. Um, my second overall pick, I had the choice between Miko Ranton and Jack Eichel was still there and I, Artemi Panarin and Steven Stamkos. Those were the guys, and they went exactly as I thought they would, by the way. So I went with Rantanen, and then that was followed up with Jack Eichel, Steven Stamkos, and Artemi Panarin. Like, I knew those guys wouldn't be available in round three, that they were going to go probably in the second round, and, and they all did. They went back to back to back to back. Um, so that was kind of interesting in itself. Um, you know, I couldn't get my hands on McKinnon, obviously. So I felt like, well, getting your hands on Mika Rantanen seems to be a pretty good idea. I know he got hurt, so it's just kind of slowing down his current right current season. But, I mean, Jack Eichel has to do a lot of the work by himself. He's really, really good. Um, you know, I was more hesitant between taking Rantanen or Panarin. Um, you know, Panarin does a lot of good things. I just, I really liked having another elite goal scorer in Rantanen, and I know that he can pick up all kinds of points power play and whatnot i just felt like that was the better pick that i was going to go with there uh round three showed up and i went with an early goalie here and it was tough because there were a lot of good players that were still left on the board there were a lot of goalies that were left as well um but i went with carter hart here so i went with a younger goalie yes um i think he's the real deal in philadelphia now right um i think this philadelphia team is a lot better than i think people want to give it credit for carter hart is one of the better goalies i do have him in my top 10 i don't feel like i reached too far here some of the more you know some of the better goalies were already taken and better in my mind. I know Vasilevsky gets a you know he's a first round goalie a lot of times. I know that let's say you know Freddie Anderson was taken in the second round. I, I I mean I'm not as high on him as I guess other people are. Ben Bishop went early as well. Um, Igor Shosturkin went in the well he was the first pick of the third round, and then you kind of saw some goalies start to go out the board. So Connor Hellebuck went as well in the third round. I didn't want to fall too far behind on goalies here. Um, so I went with Carter Hart. I felt like he was the better choice here. Um, there's not, he doesn't have to worry too much about, you know, the guy behind him taking too many starts away from him. So to me, that's where I wanted to go. I knew there weren't a massive amount of goalies, you know, that I liked a ton of. I wasn't as high on, let's say, goalies who went afterwards. Guys like, um, you 
Tuka Rask went later, and I wasn't kind of, you know, hot on taking him, right? I think Yaroslav Halak takes a lot of starts from him, and if I'm taking a, a top goalie, I kind of want him to play, you know, I'm looking for him to play about 60 games in a season. Lucky. Between 55 and 60, that's when I want my starting goalie to play. Um, and that's not going to be the case, let's say, for players like Ben Bishop or Tuka Rask. So I wasn't going to pay up for those players at that point. Um, like I said, I left some players on the board i don't think i would have gone with a forward again in the third round i know i left you know a defenseman like roman yossi on the board and he went two picks afterwards so i mean it was what it was but i felt like i needed to get a goalie in round four i was going to target another goalie sometimes and i know in other drafts that i've had right targeting goalies is quite hard they're very volatile but when you start to see a couple go off the board right usually that causes a kind of a chain effect right and i didn't want to wait too long to take a goalie because i kind of wanted to take goalies who were still either not i, I mean I, I wouldn't say elite but they're still pretty good they're in or goalies that can have a top 10 value at the end of the year so again i was gonna i was maybe looking at taking a defenseman in this round there wasn't many that were left and i kind of I went in the fourth round. I'm going to say who I went with. I, I went with Mark Andre Fleury. My original target was Jordan Biddington. He was taking two picks before me. So, I mean, it was what it was. I did leave, let's say, Dougie Hamilton on the board, and same thing. He went three picks afterwards. Um, I just I wanted to take a goalie. I saw some of them were going off the board quick here. So even before I got to my pick, there's two goalies that go off the board. And I'm kind of like, man, all right. So I went here with, I mean, Mark andre Fleury's got a, l- a little bit of criticism. A lot of people are, you know, obviously stating that he wasn't as good this season as he was the season before. Um, in my mind, I don't know what's going to happen. Again, this is a really early draft. But my assumption was maybe, you know, the Vegas Golden Knights re-sign Robin Leonard. And Robin Leonard's a really good goalie. Right, like I think he's pretty good. I think he's been in some tough situations. He was really good um, in Long Island, right? He was very good in Chicago as well, despite Chicago giving up a massive amount of shots per game. So I feel like what's important for Marc Andre Fleury is maybe you know limit the amount of starts that he's going to get. He plays a lot of hockey, and I think maybe Vegas. I mean, Vegas still has a pretty good team. Their defense is very you know defensive. I think their team structure is still pretty good. So. I went with Flurry here. I didn't want to pass on him and then, you know, be stuck with maybe a, another goalie that I wasn't kind of hot on later on. So that's where I went with in round four. Round five shows up. And now I have, so I have two forwards and two goalies. I need to take a defenseman. And I see there are a couple that are left on the board that I kind of like. So I originally wanted to go with Kale McCarr, but again, he was sniped right before me. Seth Jones, Kale McCarr on my list. They went. Both of them went before me. So I went with my third best defenseman that I thought was. And it was Quinn Hughes. Um, again, Quinn Hughes having a pretty good season. Caleb McCarr or Quinn Hughes, kind of like a toss-up, one-for-one kind of. I think Quinn Hughes has, I'm not going to say more. I do like Caleb McCarr. That was the player I would have taken had both been available. Um, I think Colorado is a not maybe not a better team, but maybe they're more offensively friendly at this point. I do think Quinn Hughes, I mean, there's a lot of support around him still. Guys like Edler, guys like Tyler Myers. I think the team is pretty good, so maybe they'll let him, you know, skate out a bit. Um, again, I knew I was going to leave some some elite scorers on the board, right? There are still some very, very good players available, but I, I needed to take a defenseman here, and I did. I did take him. Um, I don't regret the pick that I made there. I think it was pretty good. I mean, there's some pretty good or high risk players that went after but i was specifically happy with the player with taking hughes at that point round six shows up and i again my initial thought was i wanted to go with a, with a defenseman and i did here it was a toss-up for me between zach Wierenski and chris letang i i went with zach Wierenski. i thought maybe letang could fall to round seven that's kind of way back but i was hoping that maybe his injury past would kind of bring down his value it didn't because he went four picks after Warinsky but um you know Zach Warinsky has a ton of goals this season I think he has like 17 or something so um 
I was definitely going to go with a defenseman who was scoring, you know, a lot of goals, which is important for me, I guess, in my in my mind. Defensemen are kind of hard to kind of target. I think Seth Jones, Zach, Zach Wierenski is kind of like a nice one-two punch there. Um, so for me, he was kind of one of those defensemen. Do I think he can score 20 goals as a defenseman? No. But, I mean, whatever he's done up till now has been... Um, really good so i'm gonna go with i i I decided i was gonna go with that i felt like it was it was important to again take a defenseman um i like i said i just i didn't want to wait that's kind of the hard part here i didn't want to wait too long because at, at one point defensemen they just kind of all look alike right and when they all look alike like it doesn't make a difference which one you kind of pick i mean they're just all the same and to me again it was his injury history did scare me i probably would have taken him in the seventh round if he was there because i mean why not he's still um the quarterback on the power play he can still play i mean his injuries are his injuries but i mean it is what it is um correction zach Warinsky has so in the 63 games that he's played this season he has 20 goals and 21 assists my apologies to zach Warinsky. i thought he had less but again if you can get a 20 goal defenseman in the sixth round like that's pretty that's pretty decent he may not have the points right that you kind of want but i feel like you know this columbus team has been so beaten up that i think their their overall goal scoring has been has been down and it's i think it's been expected but i think if this team healthy they can probably play better than what they're doing now so to me it was a good pick here i like it no regrets uh, round seven shows up, and now so now let let's recap. I have two forwards, two defensemen, two goalies. So I'm pretty average everywhere, and now I'm just saying, well, okay, let's let's see what's available. And I thought about maybe going with a defenseman. Didn't like um, what was available at that point. Um, I did want to vote Teravainen, and again, he got sniped before me. So. I mean, that sucks. Um, Shveshnikov and Turnovine were two players. They both went in the seventh round early. I ended up going with William Nylander in this case. Uh, I think he is an elite player. Getting him at this point, he could probably score 30 goals playing on that Toronto team. And whether he plays with Matthews or whether he plays with Tavares, I mean, it doesn't make a difference. This guy is going to play elite minutes. He's starting to shoot the puck more. He's shooting it from in tight. I do think that he can get, you know, he can score goals. He can rack up points. I, I mean, he's not a 70-point player in my mind. Do I think he can be at some point? Maybe. I think another extra year under his belt kind of helps. And, again, he's got, he in, in his 68 games that he played this season, he had 31 goals. He had 60 points, Right? Do I think he could have gotten to the 70 point plateau? Probably. Do I think he repeats it again? I mean, it's possible. But if you're getting a 70 point player in the seventh round, like that's that's not bad for me with, with the options that were there. Like I said, I I did like Shmeshnikov and Turovinen more, but I'm okay with the Nylander pick. I think he has maybe the most upside in that round that I picked. Right. There were some other good players that went. Let's say, you know, Kyle Connor went there as well. Um, Brady Kachuk went there as well. Um, Evgeny Kuznetsov went after, right? I kind of looked at him, but I was like, man, okay, no. I, I still think Backstrom's going to play with Ovechkin a lot more. Um, Shea Weber, Mark Giordano went in that round as well as defensemen. Pekarene, Elvis Merzlikens, both goalies went in that round. So, again, I mean, I, I wanted to load up on another goal scoring forward. I did. Round eight shows up. Same thing, looking around, seeing what I could take. Um, it was between, for me, it was between Brock Besser and Alex DeBrincat. Alex DeBrincat went later on in that round. I went with Brock Besser. Um, he was injured, right, this season, so that kind of slowed him down. I do think at some point the Vancouver Canucks are just going to play, um, you know, JT Miller, Elias Pettersson, and Brock Besser together a lot and Besser is a goal scorer he can definitely finish the puck Elias Pettersson is a elite 
in my mind, player who can move the pit, but just in general, that line can do a lot of damage. Vancouver also has a really solid top line, right? We're with, with Bo Horvat, so I think they can play a lot of the tougher matchups, and that kind of maybe helps Vancouver's second line get maybe some easier matchups. So I really like the Brock Besser pick. I think it's a little bit more risque, maybe, just because he... he he has been injured. I don't think, you know, there's a possibility that he may finish the season next season with 40 points only. But I like the uh, what was taken there. Interesting pick in this eighth round, though. Alex Lee Lafreniere went as well. Um, I mean, that's kind of early, I guess, for a rookie. But I see the appeal in wanting to take, you know, that kind of player at that spot. So just an interesting, like I said, just interesting. Um, round nine shows up. And I went with a defenseman here. I went with Shea Theodore. Um, he was there. I wanted to add another defenseman. There were some other ones that I maybe were thinking about. Didn't happen. Um, I do think Shea Theodore can be a 50-plus point defenseman for the Vegas Golden Knights. He has the offensive skill. There's not a lot of defensemen on that Vegas blue line that are offensively minded i guess you could say shea theodore is probably the best one out of them so i decided to go with him add another defenseman to my list uh round 10 shows up this one was a really easy one for me um there's a little bit of risk here involved but i was happy with the pick i went with john gibson um i know the anaheim ducks are a trash can of a hockey team i don't actually think they're that bad though i they, they made some moves. They got a little bit younger. They brought in some new skill. Um, I don't think their defense is as terrible as it is, but they do have some work. But John Gibson, to me, is a lot like Carey Price in some way. To me, I look at him as an above-average goalie playing on a team that is not that great, right? And Carey Price went way earlier than John Gibson did. So... Um, Gibson also has Ryan Miller in net. Not a goalie who's going to steal a whole bunch of starts, but he can play here and there. To me, it just felt like there's a lot of upside in taking him there. In the 10th round is my third goalie. If he can really produce, then, I mean, fine. Maybe that kind of balances out maybe Marc-Andre Fleury playing fewer games, but I just I wanted to go with another goalie here. I saw the value in taking him. Nothing wrong with having three goalies in the top 10. If anything, you know, one of them either, you know, maybe gets hurt or maybe, you know, they Gibson returns to old form and then you can trade him maybe for a forward, sell high on him. So to me, it was an excellent, excellent pick on my part. Uh, <laughs> round 11 shows up and this was an interesting round as well. Uh, Martin Jones won in the 11th round here. I didn't take him, obviously, but... Kind of interesting that Martin Jones was picked right off, right before Brendan Gallagher was picked. I didn't take him as well. The player that I absolutely wanted here, I know there are some other good players that went in this round, including Brian Rust, Evgeny Dodonov, Philip Forsberg, uh, Sean Monaghan, uh, Timo Meyer. The player I took was Anthony Mantha, and I am really high on Mantha. I know he was injured this season as well. But to me, this is, a, this is an elite goal scorer who just hasn't gotten here yet. And in my books, you know, Mantha has always been a goal scoring machine. He has scored over 50 goals in his last two junior season, in his last two junior years. Um, it kind of sucks that he got hurt, right? Because again, if you read my breakdown at the beginning of the year, I was really high on Mantha. I do think he can score 40 goals, even if he plays on a god awful Red Wings team. Like, that team is absolute trash, but assuming let's assume they win the lottery, let's assume they draft Lafreniere, right? So now you have Lafreniere playing at center. You have you know Dylan Larkin as maybe your top center. You can put Mantha with Larkin, and you can play him with Lafreniere. You know he can move the puck. Whether he can do it at the NHL level, kind of you know I, I don't think it's to be seen. But can he do it effectively? Who knows? But you know Mantha has an elite NHL shot. He can bury the puck. He's a big boy and i do see him scoring 35 goals can he score 40 i mean that's a stretch i i think he has the shot i don't know but in the 11th round getting a pure goal scorer like sign me up i probably would have taken him inside the top 100 which brings me to the top to the start of the ninth round 
I waited and I knew he would probably be there because I know a lot of times people kind of look at terrible teams and say, oh, I'm not going to draft players from there. But you still need players on that team to score goals and do stuff. And as bad as Detroit is, they still need players to score goals. And Mantha can do that. He's not going to lose his spot to anybody else, right? It's not just an abdicator, Luke Glenn Denning taking his spot. I mean, Blashill has some work to do there. Maybe keeping, you know, Mantha with good players all the time would probably help. But again, it is what it is. Um, round 12 shows up. Um, I stuck with a forward here as well. Wanted to load up on a couple of uh, a couple more. No real thought for me here. I was going to take Sam Reinhardt no matter what in the 12th round. Um, and I did. Um, Jack Eichel is the you know top player for the for Buffalo, but he's going to need somebody to help him. And Sam Reinhardt plays with Eichel, you know, five on at five on five and on the power play. So Eichel can't score them all. Somebody's going to have to pass him the puck as well, or vice versa. You know, Sam Reinhardt's there. There's not really much that I like about Buffalo, but I do like those two. Again, if I can't get a piece of Eichel. Then I'm going to get a piece of somebody who plays with him. Sam Reinhardt's going to play with him, I assume, as long as humanly possible. So it was a nice place for me here. Can Reinhardt finish with 60 points? I mean, that's a stretch maybe, but I like it. It was a better pick. I'm okay with it. Uh, round 13 showed up, and I went back to kind of... I, well, I mean, I, I went with a forward here again. Um... I didn't really look at anything else. There were not many defensemen left that I really wanted to target. So I knew I had to load up on some forwards. And I knew that if I needed a defenseman, I'd get one much later on. So I went with Anze Kopitar here. And again, a good player playing on a bad team or a rebuilding team at this point. And the upside here for me, I think, is that I know he had that one good year. And I... I kind of, I did say some nice things. I was really high on him. Again, I thought he could reproduce 90 plus points. And then he he didn't. He had a down season, right? Well, I mean, down season. It was what it was. But I know that he plays, like he he's, he's the top centerman, right? He plays five on five. Um, he plays the penalty kill. He does a whole bunch of, of good things. And a lot of times, like I say, when I break down, let's say, DFS slates, you want to target players who have volume, right? Players who get opportunities to succeed. And Kopitar gets those opportunities. He had 92 points in 2017, 2018. He only had 16, 2019. That's a 32-point drop. Can he score 30-plus goals again? I mean, I don't know, but he's going to be able to assist. I know the Kings are rebuilding, but you know, he had 62 points in 70 games this season. Let's say he finishes with 65 which is quite possible, picks up three points in the next you know, 12 games. Okay, possible. But he doesn't get injured a lot. He plays all kinds of situations, um, doesn't take a bunch of penalty minutes and whatnot. Despite the Kings being, I mean, a trash can of a team, he's a plus six if your league you know, counts that. So to me, um, it was he was a safe pick. He's a player that I can kind of count on. I took him here and I said, okay, I'll go with it. Um, round 14 showed up. I went with a forward again. At this point, I know there's not a lot of defense in that are left, but again, there's not many that I like. So I said, well, okay, I have, and in this format, we only had to start kind of four. I usually don't take an extra defenseman unless I need one, but I felt like it was important at that point to kind of target the players that I wanted to target. And I knew that I was, I, I had what? I had Quinn Hughes, um, Zach Wierenski, and Shea Theodore. So those are the three defensemen that I needed on my team. Uh, so I went with Thomas Tatar. And some people call it a homer pick. I guess so. But he, he has been nothing but good for Montreal this season. I mean, he has been, he's their top point getter. Um, and he's done this now back-to-back seasons with 60-plus points. Next season is a contract year for him. So if the Montreal Canadiens are out of a playoff spot, I expect them to I expect them to trade him. Um, or if they are in a playoff spot or a playoff hunt or you know they make the playoffs, then he's going to stick around. He's going to be looking for some big money. And to me, like he's had two good seasons. If he can be 
just as good or better next season. If you're getting a 60-plus point player in the 14th round, again, not that bad. I prefer him over some of the players I went before him, and I was really cool with it. So, yeah, as a 163rd overall pick, I can live with that. Round 15 was here. I went with a defenseman, kind of. I couldn't get, like I said, I couldn't get my hands on Kale McCarr, so I got my hands on Sam Girard. Now, I know Sam Girard is, I mean, he's not going to get you a bunch of goals, right? But, I mean, he is he is the player that he is. And do I think he can take a step next season? Yes. Do I think it's a great, like a really big step? No. But I do think he can probably finish with 40-plus points. And at, at, at this point, I mean, a 40-point defenseman is fine. Like I said, he's not going to get a whole bunch of goals. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, at this point of the draft, you're kind of shooting some darts at boards and seeing what sticks. So Sam Gerrard it was. And in the 16th round here, I went back to a goalie. I could have taken a forward. I wasn't going to take another defenseman. I, I don't hoard defensemen. I, I take the ones that I have. And then if I need them over, you know, if I need one during the season, because one gets hurt, I'll replace them on the waiver wire. Or try to stream a couple. I went with Tristan Jarry at this point. So I took four goalies. It's not unlikely of me to do that. I kind of like to take a couple. Because it's hard to replace goalies. Especially in 12 team leagues. Right? If you take good goalies. Then you can kind of move them later words for whatever you need. Or again, if injuries happen. Or you know another goalie's not good. Well, you're not scrambling trying to trade top goal scorers. For you know mid-level goalies. So... In my mind, Tristan Jerry is the starting goalie for the Pittsburgh Penguins. He started a lot of games midway through the year. And then towards the end of the season, Pittsburgh started giving Matt Murray more starts. I don't know why, because he's still not that great. And they were kind of splitting the task. But in my mind, Tristan Jerry at some point is going to take over the starting job. He's the much better goalie. If I'm getting a starting goalie in the 16th round, especially ones that, the one that plays for the Penguins... Okay, <laughs> like Matt Murray went way before that. Um, what round did he go? I didn't mention it, but uh, Matt Murray went in the eighth round. So eight rounds later, I get his quote-unquote backup who could become a starter, right? So I definitely, uh, that was probably one of my favorite picks that I made. I have four goalies, four good goalies in my mind, Um Again, I could spot start Tristan Jerry if you know it is what it is there, but I really do like the pick. I think again, there were some players that were available afterwards. Some players went undrafted, but I I wasn't going to take another forwards. Not something that I needed, right? I could at this point late in the draft, you could probably find that player on the waiver wire or stream another forward if one of them gets hurt. Um, I just wanted to have that. Excess, not excess, I guess, but I wanted to have four goalies that I know could play. And all four of my goalies I know are good. If I need to, you know, work around and spot start a couple of them, I will. But overall, I was really happy with my team. I think I did a pretty decent job. So that was pretty good. Uh, and yeah, that was the draft. 16, uh, 16 round draft, 12 team league, head to head categories league. I was really happy with it. This team will never see the day of light, but. It was nice to be able to do mock draft. I'll probably do a couple more over the summer. Just try to keep myself occupied. But really happy with my team. Like I said, I'll drop the link. Um, it'll definitely be on uh, YouTube, so you can check that out if you want as well. Um, it'll be, like I said, on the FantasyFix.com website where you can check as well at the bottom. Uh, go through all the other players and other people and look at their picks. See, you know, if, if you like my picks or you didn't like them, you can always... You know, shoot me a DM at Fuzzy Chris ninety one. Don't forget to follow me. You can follow the podcast as well on Twitter at Slapshot Podcast. Just let me know if you like the team or not. Maybe it's cool. If you're doing a mock draft <laughs> coming up, you can always send me an invite. I got lots of time, so I'll do one with you. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's a wrap for now. It's uh, so like I said, as always, thank you for uh, joining me today. I know, like I said, it's not easy. There's not a lot of sports to talk about. Um, I mean, the Quebec government is looking to maybe delay all 
uh, festivals and sports gatherings till at least August 31st. So if that does happen, then that pretty much puts a nail in the coffin for this season. Really sucks, but like I said, it it, it is what it is. It's important to stay healthy. Um, stay home if you're sick. Wash your hands a lot. And uh, we'll talk again soon. Bye-bye.